Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, where it is a stream with my friends. And today I have with me here, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> and Landon, what are we talking about today? We are talking about the one, the only, the Order of the Phoenix. We're doing yes. a deep dive on all the characters of our favorite adults in this kid series. And uh, because it's mostly happening off screen, most of this will be fandom. So buckle up, kiddos. Yes. All right. So we talked a little bit about the Order of the Phoenix in general in a previous episode of um, of actually talking about the books, but we really didn't go into the individual characters. And so we really wanted to spend some time with them and talk about them because this is the area, at least for me, of Harry Potter that really helped me like continue to stay in the fandom past when I started like not being quite as into the book. So I shared this with you guys um, on a previous episode where, you know, I love the third book. I love the fourth book. And then starting in the fifth book, I kind of start to get a little bit um, not as interested in canon, but uh, we have all of these wonderful characters that we know have this rich backstory that we're not shown in canon. And I just dove head into that. I got super into that. And that really became my Harry Potter experience throughout the fifth through seventh books and beyond. Yeah. No. Yeah. And there are just so many cool, like, again, JK Rowling. Also, you have to say this. Fuck Joey and Rowling. Oh, yeah. But... We can do our disclaimers, too. Here, go ahead and say what you want to say, and then we'll do our normal Harry oh, Potter disclaimers. Yes. Uh, but she creates great places and locations in the world, and she also creates skeleton, great skeleton characters that as long as they are never dove into more than a brief mention and maybe a cool job and concept, they're really cool. Uh, and luckily, we get that with several harry potter characters when we are introduced there when we're introduced to the order of the phoenix yes okay so as always of course during our harry potter episodes we will let you know that this is not spoiler free if you care about harry potter spoilers at this point like i don't even know to be honest like it's 2022 you either you either read them a long time ago or you have uh given up avoiding spoilers it's just it shouldn't be a thing but yes this is spoilers for the entire wizarding world everything other things might come up that aren't necessarily connected to um the fifth or earlier books that we might say also we do not support joe and rolling at all in any form or fashion um, we believe she is a turf. We believe that she is ultimately harmful. And we also believe that um, some of that did leak into the, the book. So we're going to be talking about some of that stuff and just want to make it clear that we also do not agree with um, giving Joanne financial support if you can avoid it. And that does mean for this particular episode, like with all of our Harry Potter episodes, if you would like to financially support us, you can. But we would very much prefer that you took your bits, your subscription, the money that you were going to put into that, and instead donate it to a place like the Trevor Project or whatever your favorite um, trans-affiliated charity is that helps out trans youth. Yes, please. Yes. Um, also, you know, I have to say this every episode, fuck turfs. Fuck turfs. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> fuck turfs yep and welcome in jane welcome in i hope you are um crossing some animals while you're listening to us today uh because i plan to cross some animals after some after stream so i'll be hitting you up for that <laughs> apparently everyone is playing animal crossing is what i've been informed of i yeah. didn't realize that it was 2020 again <laughs> yeah we all went back we all were we all were like wow the pandemic's ending we want to go back to how we felt when the pandemic started and we all started playing animal crossing again so that's a thing <laughs> <laughs> you are good okay good all right you guys um let's start let's get into it here we go okay so the order of the phoenix who are they so we're gonna go through some of our favorite order of the phoenix characters and kind of break them down and all that fun stuff so let's get started with that so the first one that we want to talk about is the weasley crew so we have talked about weasley's um, pretty regularly throughout this, especially in the in the relation to the first book, um, but uh, but they're back again. Some of them are old enough that they're part of the Order of the Phoenix. So, which ones are actually in the Order Land? And refresh my memory. As of the fifth book, Bill Weasley, Molly Weasley, and Arthur Weasley are the only Order member uh, Order members that are Weasley crew. However, we see Fred and George and Ron 
and Jenny to an extent really trying to like push themselves in there they're like child army what's that let's be a part of the real thing um there is like whisper that there's an international idea of Charlie being like Charlie's mentioned I think briefly but he's not in he's not in Great Britain so it really just is Bill returning from Egypt and joining the fight Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we do love bill we do love bill we love bill uh i'm very excited for his little subplot that happens uh in the sixth book where he gets you know killed or not killed he gets harmed by a werewolf and then comes werewolf adjacent because joanne doesn't fucking know how werewolves work um (laughs) so becomes like werewolf adjacent but also starts a love affair with uh, Fleur Delacour because everybody knows everybody in the wizarding world and it's honestly amazing I love it I love it also Harry has such a big gay crush on Bill Weasley uh I was like Joanne I understand that this man makes you really attracted to him but mm-hmm. your 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 attraction to him is bleeding through this 15 year old boy oh my god but (laughs) how often does that happen like how often often does that happen it it doesn't just it doesn't just affect bill i feel like there's um there's passages where it's like wow i guess harry thinks that Sirius is like really beautiful you know (laughs) there is genuine proof that harry potter is queer because of how much author slippage there is with joanne (laughs) Rowling being like this man super cool and by cool i mean i'd fuck him if he was real life (laughs) i mean i really can't disagree when it comes to bill to be perfectly honest like he's great he's cool he's got all of the um great qualities about the weasleys and none of the annoying ones like he's just fucking awesome you know no there is a there's like a sound on um on tiktok that's one of my favorite sounds it's the by wife energy sound and it's like a, it's like a, it's like a trend where they put up a, a man and then his wife is bi. And so it just is like going through like what bi wife energy looks like. And Bill Weasley has bi wife energy, good ally, kind hearted, isn't like super into his own masculinity, certainly isn't toxic, uh, is a, is someone that could hold a cup for any woman at a party a hundred percent. And that's what Bill Weasley is. And it's refreshing because this might be the first time we meet a character like that. Oh my gosh, you're right. I would so let Bill hold my cup. I would be like, just like five minutes, I really have to pee. Thank you so much. And you know what? He'd be honored and he would protect that cup with his life. He would. He would. <laughs> he can He can watch my purse in the airport. He can oh. hold my cup at a party. You know, Bill's just Bill's just amazing. And, and so- um, I, my only regret with Bill is like, is like... I, it, and this is like of two I'm of two minds in this with a lot of these characters like I want more but not by Joanne <laughs> not by Joanne and that's why fandom is wonderful mm-hmm, because fandom mm-hmm. gives us more fandom gives us information about like how Bill Weasley feel, felt like he abandoned his family and so that's why he came back and he's like living up to the expectation that he's the eldest and he feels all of this responsibility uh and it's it's awesome to have that depth given to us by fandom Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) um but no very quickly i was gonna say if we ever do a harry potter ranking episode at any point in time about anything i think one of the things we should rank is which men we'd let hold our cups (laughs) because i think that would be interesting (laughs) anyway which 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 harry potter boys can hold your cup at the party oh my god Yes. Which one would you trust to hold your cup? And what would they do if you asked them to? Yes, a rank <laughs> and a rank list, like tiers, right? A tier mm-hmm. list of mm-hmm. like allowed to hold the cup. <laughs> can hold the cup would definitely, the top tier would be like, can hold the cup, would protect cup with life. Mm-hmm. Bottom beer <laughs> tier is, would be the person not doing good things to the cup. Or yeah, it, like it would, it would be like, would absolutely roofie your cup. Would absolutely <laughs> your cup and in there would be like would say that he'd hold on to his cup your cup and then put your cup down (laughs) um that that. sounds like draco that's draco energy sure no problem Uh, no because i have a feeling draco would just look at you and be like absolutely not go ask somebody else (laughs) (laughs) see i feel like he would say yes and then put it down just like one of those two it would be one of, it would matter the mood if, he, if you're an important person he would be like sure and then put it down and if you're not an important person he'd be like go ask harry potter oh my gosh one of the rankings has to be yes and would drink it <laughs> Fred, 
<laughs> and George. Fred and George. Yes, people. and would drink it. Yes, anyway, and would drink it. This is happening. I'm writing it down in our ideas folder. Okay, put it in the ideas folder. We'll we'll try to do that. Um, hold, cup holding ranking for uh the Harry Potter men. So, uh, but you I have to. Me about stupid, stupid things. <laughs> that we would need. I have to ask you though, in regard to um to Bill in particular with the Weasleys, like tell me how mm -hmm. on on a scale of like absolutely to yes where is like your otp for bill and floor like how good is that oh. ship how good is that ship it's so good so, right i think it's I so think good it probably be my second highest straight ship in the harry potter universe yeah it's good it's good it's really it's, good and it's so just like like it's so subtle it's like there but not. And I'm like sitting there and, and I think what makes it even better is that we see the faults in Molly, mm -hmm. even though she's not considered faulted for this, but we see like Molly is very, very judgmental of Fleur yes. throughout the sixth and seventh book. Uh, she gets better in the seventh, but certainly through the sixth book about how Fleur like just thinks so highly of herself and just thinks that she's so pretty and thinks that she's so amazing and like they Ginny and her make Ginny and Molly make fun of Fleur a lot they can't stand uh, that we, she's prettier than them they just can't stand no, it they can't stand it at all and it's like this idea that he, like Molly almost thinks that Fleur is too pretty for her son yes which is like low-key insult to your son who by the way is a curse breaker which is canonly one of the hardest jobs to have who was head or was he was head boy uh when he went through hogwarts so obviously mm -hmm. academically very smart responsibly very smart he helped send money to the family like obviously an incredible boy yeah, and all we're ever told is good things about him being like, you're like sitting there and being like oh this girl is so hot he she obviously is gonna leave my son at some point yeah like what like what is wrong with like there is so much wrong with that it's like i can't believe it because like literally we're never told a bad quality we're never told a bad quality that bill has and i'm sure like everyone has some like he must have some right but like as far as what we are shown and the actions that he takes in canon like he never does anything egregious he's just always like trying his best and, and doing everything that he possibly can no, and he's and he's fantastic, and he's yeah. sweet, and he's kind, and and so then Fleur also we see Fleur only as an object of desire, and someone who cannot keep up magically with three other strong wizards. Yep. Like that's how she's introduced in the fourth. That's what we're given, and so then we see her in the sixth, being completely in love with this man, and we as the readers are told that we should hate her, and then be surprised when she has this moment of being like i think we're i'm good looking for the two of us which also like by the way such a fucking insult like if you have scars you're fine <laughs> like like sitting there and being like oh my god my son is horribly ravaged from this werewolf and no person will ever find him attractive again yeah, and then his like, scars are like the sexiest god. fucking thing like yes <laughs> It's like it's um, like the the I'm a monster phantom and then he takes off his mask and it's like the coolest fucking scar across his eye. It's like that version of the phantom, right? It really, it really is. Mm -hmm. Um except it's Molly Weasley projecting it onto her son. Yeah. But uh, I think that it just it really we don't get the pleasure of seeing a happy relationship in this series that that we are not like put through strife for true um the only other relationship that we really see that ends happily like i'm not even going to count harry and jenny because they break up and we never see them get together again uh they just do is is ron and hermione and even then there's six books of like pining for it <laughs> there's like so much will they want won't they there it's not really you know it's not really yeah. the same thing Especially through the fifth and through fourth through six, there is mm -hmm. a lot of will they won't they, mm -hmm. um, and it's so it's like it's nice to sit there and be like, oh man, this is there are happy people in the world. Yeah, <laughs> that's so nice. And also one of my absolute top ships in the world, fandom wise, is is uh, Teddy and uh, Victoire, who are Fleur and Bill's daughter. Mm -hmm. or, Victoire is so I'm like I just support it simply because then Victoire exists <laughs> it's a good name like, it's a it's a really good name it's such a good name but also such an amazing character 
<laughs> yes. Yes, skeleton characters. Yes. So in addition, in addition to um to all of those guys in you know to Bill, there's also Molly and Arthur. So we haven't really talked much about Arthur and his role here. And something that I think we um we need to point out is that there was a chance that in the fifth book that instead of Sirius being the one that got killed, it could have been Arthur. And it was something that came down to like a as a final decision of the editors. You know, they didn't really know and. Um, you know, Arthur is definitely one of Harry's father figures, not nearly as much as Sirius, but still still there as a father figure. And I actually believe that um, that if it weren't for some of the other things going on and uh, and some of the actions that Sirius took and some of the ways that Molly felt that uh, Arthur might have been like, you know, they can just join. Like, I know they're kids, but like they can just join. And that's like such well, Arthur energy to me. Arthur is the checked out overworked dad like he just he everyone is like oh my god Arthur Weasley is the best dad I'm like Arthur Weasley was never around and when he was around he was fighting a war like he it's never true. was dad and so yeah absolutely I think that he would have never doubted his underage children to join a war if it mm -hmm. hadn't been for Molly Weasley yeah um yeah. I think yeah I think Arthur like that's a very interesting idea that Arthur would have been the person who died in the in the fifth book um it would have in some in some aspects uh given Harry the same amount of accountability and responsibility in his own like uh, feeling of I am responsible and I did this sort of feeling as serious as death did so it, it makes sense they mirror each other very well um However, it it was not the better choice. And I'm glad that the editors and Joanne ended up going with Sirius because as much as Harry sees him as a father figure, Arthur isn't around enough for the readers to be convinced that he's a father figure. Right. Um, so we wouldn't have felt that loss as much as we felt it was Sirius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is interesting to know that like this overworked, tired, exhausted human being is like, spending hours guarding a door in a hallway in the place that he works like that's just so funny <laughs> to think about. how did he stay away from his desk so long without his boss catching on i want i want to learn your secrets arthur please tell I me i think the whole thing <laughs> doesn't have a boss isn't he like the only person in the department like i don't makes... remember it just never yeah, but that so... doesn't make sense to me so like if that's true then that's probably why i no. forgot is because i was like that's dumb <laughs> No, there's only one other. This was in the fifth book when they were going to the trial. There's like, they, their office is, in, his office is with one other person who is like 30 or 40 years older than he is. Like he's about to die sort of age. And they're in like an old restored broom closet, like a stretched out broom closet. And that's it. And I think Arthur doesn't have a boss. Like, so like the only person that could have tattled on him. Courts to, but there's mm. probably, but there's probably isn't someone overseeing him actively he's like head of the department um but like but like no one takes the department seriously and he's also not a man to take serious well that's that's both true so then his the only person that could have tattled on him was somebody that had like one foot in retirement anyway and so was absolutely not going to do that absolutely and probably didn't understand half of the things that arthur was doing <laughs> Like that's the other thing oh, too man. is that Arthur was like actively breaking the laws that he was trying to protect. Like true, it, he's an interesting he's an interesting human being. Yeah. Oh my um, god, the dream though. Like imagine getting paid for something that both you love to do, and two, no one tells you what to do, so you can do whatever you want. Um, and three, you get to feel justified in uh, in breaking the rules like all the time. What a dream! What a dream! <laughs> Okay, see, here is the here is the pipeline of my thoughts. I was like, yeah, that would be really cool. Oh my god, that would be so cool. It would be really oh cool god, until you got caught. Is, the world is corrupt because that is currently <laughs> happening to some people. That they are the people in charge of the laws, so they know how to break the laws. Since no one's going to come after them, since they'll never come after themselves. That is corruption and capitalism, my friend. That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's true. But when Arthur Weasley does it, it looks like cool and fun. <laughs> I mean. Yes. And I also would love to be an important cog in the capitalistic machine because then I wouldn't be suffering from it. Oh my God. Hey, any like sugar daddy, sugar mamas out there that are listening, um, give us millions of dollars so that we can invest it and become cogs in the capitalist machine, please. Or <laughs> invest it and become cogs in the capitalistic machine. Or also just pay me to do art. 
Ooh. So I don't have to engage in capitalism oh. other than the bare necessities. <laughs> oh, fun. Okay. Anyways, what else about the Weasleys? What else about the Weasleys? I think it's just very interesting. Um, Molly being the voice of reason. Mm. But because this is from an unreasonable point of view, her voice of reason sounds unreasonable. It's a very interesting sort of situation that that I think goes like is the art of it all. Mm -hmm. Um, But like we're getting Harry's perspective on Molly Weasley being what Harry perceives as overbearing. But also, like, if you take the step out, you're like, no, Molly Weasley makes sense as a character. It is not just being a heinous bitch. She is protecting children. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's right. Like, a lot of her takes that are that are really annoying to Harry um, and, and to Fred and George especially, like, she's right. I'm like, if these are kids. <laughs> yeah. These are kids. I think that also it's interesting that that <sighs> she is the only one she and Arthur, but we really, again, we don't inter- interact. Yeah, but it's with really Molly. It's really Molly. He is the only one of all of these characters that wasn't involved in the war the first go around. She truly lived through the war and th- that was alive for it, I should say. I should cl- uh, clarify that. That was alive for it, that lived through it, but didn't actively fight in it. Yeah. And so it's just very interesting to like see her being involved now and the reasons why uh, and what that looks like. Very true. Very true. Because all um, the other characters were involved. Yes. And it's almost like it's almost like she kind of saw that it was happening again and kind of felt this compulsion of like, well, um, we're going to get involved. And I, and I can't help but feel like from Molly's perspective, it must be partly because uh, Ron and Harry became friends and she she got to know him on a personal level. And um, like, it has to be related to that. It has to be related to that for her because otherwise, you know, she wasn't involved the first time. So she must not feel super compelled, like ideologically. Um, she's, she's obviously not really a fighter. I mean, I know she has her moment at the end of the book, but that's supposed to be like a surprise that she would she would and could do something like that. Um, this is not like the natural Molly Weasley state, you know what and I'm saying? And it was also the display of like, it was again, that thematic motherly love can conquer yes. all. So like Lily dying protects Harry. Yes. Molly committing murder protects Jenny. Like yes. it is that, it is that like a woman can lift a car to save their baby sort of adrenaline instinct thing. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, um, Molly Weasley is uh, is an interesting character, very interesting character, um, and not one that I have really spent a huge amount of time with in the fandom. Like, I mean, obviously, like we rambled a lot about Bill, and that's I'm just gonna be super transparent. That's gonna that's because out of all the Weasleys, like that's the Weasley I've spent the most time with in the fandom, and the one that I find the most interesting, the one that I find the most compelling. So, um, so Molly is not quite as much that for me. I haven't spent nearly as much time with her character outside of canon. I think it's very interesting to also like to to see her through canon because the other thing that's like part of this is that Molly lost both her brothers to the war. Yeah. So she was attached to the war, even though she didn't engage in it, but she lost her entire family. Mm-hmm. Like she, her, her parents and her brothers were killed in the war. Um, and, and while we know nothing about the Weasleys, we have to assume since they're an old family pure blood name, that they were involved to some extent. Mm-hmm. Since we know the Pruitts were like, why wouldn't they be, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and even though there's, there's no canon talk of it, they must have been. So it just is, it, it's very interesting. And it's also very interesting that she is the only mother in the entire thing she mm-hmm. is the only and i think that also i mean again we're connecting things that were probably never thought of but it's interesting that the only mother that exists within the order of the phoenix until nymphadora tonks later in the books uh is the person that is being the most emotional and the most like like motherly role and obviously that's that's her role, but also like within the order. Like mm-hmm. she is the one that is the, she's almost a matriarch to an extent. Yeah. Like she, her control extends outside of just the people that she is a direct mother to. 
You're right. Um, yeah. Because the other women in, in the order is um, McGonagall, right? Like she's involved. Yep. She um, but of course, other. no kids. Um, and then Tonks, who at the time, for most of the books, she is she has no kids, right? Like, you know, eventually yeah. she gets pregnant and has Teddy, but like, that's not a thing until much, much later. Mm hmm. So it, so it is this interesting concept of, of parent and like, again, like looking at it and going, okay, there aren't any parents in the order of the Phoenix too, outside of Arthur and Molly and yeah. eventually Remus and Tonks. Yes. But we don't interact with any other parents. And it's just as a very, it's a very just interesting choice that, yeah again doesn't need to be explained because these characters don't have to be 3d they're all side characters but it is when we're starting to do that deep dive it's a very interesting thing like huh okay yeah yeah like That's what is the way that the mean? world is interesting okay <laughs> what does that mean? are we ready to move to the next the next characters let's do it but let's just talk very quickly just saying bill bill super hot hottest chef's hottest kiss. character chef's kiss <laughs> amazing character i mean love him okay didn't get enough of him in the movies all right moving on serious black and remus lupin so we have talked about these characters in our marauders episode if you are interested in that go find um that episode on my youtube channel so i'll post up on my socials so that you guys can see the youtube link if you're interested um so Sirius Black and Remus Lupin, we did want to touch on them again, though, as far as from the perspective of being a part of the order. So I have a question for you, Landon, since they were clearly part of it in the in the beginning, in like the original order, right? In the, Mara the Marauders era. Um, and they come back and they join it again in this era. Do you think there was ever any possibility of them not? Do you see any kind of scenario where they didn't join the order this time around? I think if Sirius wasn't alive or hadn't been good, Remus wouldn't have joined up. I think so too. I think that's the only way, right? Like either they joined I, together or they did not join. And I think the only reason Sirius joined, I think Sirius had a lot more reasons. Harry. So yeah. if Harry yeah. wasn't alive, I don't think he would. Uh, and also he had no other options. Mm -hmm. He was still like, a was criminal. What was he supposed to do? He, he, it was either, hey, be a part of this war, protect the per the only other person that you care about in this world, the person that you are, that you are, supposed to care about and have obsessively been thinking about all the ways that you failed him protect him live in your home and let us use it as the order of the phoenix safeguard because we know it's protected or live on a mountainside eating rats and starving yeah um those are your two options because those are the only options that were available to him uh and and so dumbledore once again came in and manipulated him so yep. i and, and i'm not going to even say sirius wasn't an active part of the order of the phoenix like that's the interesting part of this he did nothing he because he wasn't he let he wasn't let to do anything he was a prisoner within a home mm -hmm. that they used in the order of the phoenix and that was his only use and as someone who's all action uh that's a lot <laughs> yeah and i think remus is kind of similar in that way you know he tried. He tried very hard to, like, do a real job and, like, you know, make something of himself. You know, he was the the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher for, like, that one book. And um, the moment everyone found out that he was a werewolf, they spread it like wildfire throughout the, the parents of the Hogwarts children. And then, you know, he felt forced to resign. So, like, what is he supposed to do if he tries to do it again, if he tries to do something respectable again and actually do something with his life? Um, you know, it, it's just it's just a waiting game until the wrong person finds out, spreads it around, and then he feels like he has to leave again. Well, and he also was isolated. He had no community. He had no family. He had no one. Uh, so the one person that he has comes back mm -hmm. he's gonna remus is going to cling on and follow them into yeah. into anywhere um and that means into a war mm -hmm. um and so it's it's just very interesting obviously we only see Sirius for this book um and we see him trapped and lonely and sad and constantly i mean he so we talked a lot about him as a young kid but talking about the psychological 
distress that he was under as adults being forced back into the home in which he received the abuse of his childhood that he escaped and ran away from because it was so toxic and deadly for him Mm -hmm. at 16 at 15 years old having to go back to that be reminded and of course everything around it being cursed to hate him like there's a screaming portrait of his mother that insults him all the time Uh, and he just has to listen to that trapped in this house he has to he has to like see the elf the elf uh heads on the walls Mm -hmm. of servants that helped raise him like he he is surrounded by terrible things and there's an entire room with a tapestry in which that he has been burned out of and while he has no affiliation and love lost for any of this he certainly has unsolved trauma he has hate he has anger because again he's trapped as mentally as a 21 year old uh, through all of this, because that's when he was arrested and and went to Azkaban for and sat 12 years in Azkaban, just obsessing over all of these dark things to then be put in a place that I would argue for serious is probably worse than Azkaban. In a lot of ways, probably. Being, being told that the only good that he can give to help Harry is to sit pretty and be there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome in, Lunar. Thank you so much for the howl. I think it was well timed since we're talking about Remus right now. And welcome in, Kitty, as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, yeah, we're we're talking about Sirius and Remus at the moment. And so, yeah, I think that I think that when it comes to these two, it was a sort of situation where, um, you know, you you don't really get to have one without the other. And I think that what we continue to see in in Remus is once Sirius is gone, Remus is this sort of shell of a person. Like I know we have, um, you know, Remadora ship that kind of comes about and that gives him like a little bit of a plot line and, and whatever to follow. And it, it gives him something to do, but it's not, he, he never really feels he never really feels like as a character that he's fulfilled again. It's sort of like he has this this moment when he's the defense against the dark arts teacher where he's really involved and he's helping out Harry and there's kind of like there's a lot of smiling. There's like, you know, Remus smile. That's a that's, you know, one of the most common phrases that has his name in the books and it's because of the book that he is the defense against the dark arts teacher. And then from there on his life is just tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. He never really moves past or grows from um, being uh, well, resigning because he wasn't really fired, but he basically was um, from resigning from from Hogwarts as a professor, and um, and poor Remus, he just never really gets to find his place after this. He doesn't, and it's it's a hard, tragic pill to swallow. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that that there are a lot of shippers who will argue that he like doesn't he doesn't die like he doesn't lose himself completely after this but he does like there is there is certainly less of him and the next time we ever see him with any sort of true thought feeling everything is when he's asking when he is willing to run away and abandon his child to follow harry into this war yeah and that's in the seventh book and so like, and then, and then the next time we see him, he dies <laughs> or yeah. no, let's start. the next time he sees him, he thanks Harry for not letting him go. We learn that he has a son. And then the next time we see him, we, he dies off yeah. screen. Um, he is, he is incredibly sad and tragic. Um, and he, he is under the false pretense of his only use is to this cause is to give everything of himself. Um, because he has nothing left after Sirius dies. Yeah, not really, not really. I mean, I think I I think that um, when it comes to Remus and Tonks from Remus's perspective, that was kind of like an attempt, like maybe I could be happy again if I paired up with someone, maybe I could be happy again if I had some kind of romance in my life. But I don't think it ultimately comes to fruition. I think it is ultimately, um, you know, doomed to fail. The only way that that romance would have ever worked out is from is if Remus had sur- survived. But I think the the year that we see of the romance actually happening, there's not really much to it, unfortunately. And that's speaking as somebody that that does ship it. But I ship it in in the sense that it's like incredibly tragic and yeah. um, and and one of the and- more realistic wartime things that we see in these books. And even then, um, 
he doesn't he doesn't feel he is worthy enough for the relationship like he has to convince him to love her and then and it is it's sad I ship it too it's it's a fantastic ship um but it is that kind of like somebody loves me and I know that this is going to be tragic so Mm -hmm. I will let them love me because I because watching her be in pain not loving like not letting me love her or letting her love me is hurting her more than if I just let her love me, but she'll eventually see she'll be hurt either way. Like that's kind of what he falls into. Yes. And he just kind of lets her play second fiddle basically. Yeah. Yeah. And she lets herself play second fiddle and it's terrible. It's, it's tragic. It's tragic. Um, And we see these characters have these, this happy crescendo of a moment in the third book. And they're absent ish in the fourth it remus completely absent and in the fifth there are these moments of togetherness and we're we're doing this and then they both die off basically mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it and is then, a sad sad downhill yeah and then as a fandom at least what we believe although i do not believe that this was the original intent of um of rolling but uh but what we like to believe is that the whole reason that harry had to lose his main parent figure in Sirius, and um and why remus could not be somebody to pick that up is because we had to have harry being dumbledore soldier we had to have him see like this is what happens to people who defy me and when it comes to what happened to Sirius and how much that broke remus um, I think that's what Harry sees. That's what he. That's ultimately what we're what we're being told through the narrative is. This is what happens when people defy Dumbledore. So you better just fall in line and do what he thinks is right. Yep. And and uh, and I think that there is probably intention there. Maybe not as dour as we as we say it. But I mean, I think that that is ultimately why she decided to kill Sirius, is because Harry needed something to turn from passive watcher to a player in his own life yeah uh and this that was it Mm -hmm. that was it we love these characters you know we love uh we love Sirius and Remus so and I'm a I'm a huge I'm a huge shipper of this as well I think that there's a lot of like love here I I know that that uh I always love watching people's people interpret the different relationships during the different times of like what Wolfstar was prior to the prior to the first war and also during the first war and then also during order of the phoenix and what those love relationships look like yeah because there's so much it it just shows it's very rare that we see a character with so much growth and there are these characters have growth even though we never see that growth we only have the glimpse of the before and the after but it's cool to see that. Mm-hmm. But it's apparent. It's clear what happened. Um, oh, yeah. So, so I guess that's kind of the the last question that I want to um, ask you on Sirius and Remus. What was your experience like with Wolfstar? Can we talk about that for just a moment? Yeah. Like, what did you? So, what were you going through when you were like in this part of the fandom? I was never really into Wolfstar. Uh, I was into Drary, and and still am. But but it is. <laughs> I never really got it. I appreciated it. I liked it. I ship it, but I never was really in the fandom. And my best friend, <laughs> and my best friend was purely and securely a Remadora shipper. Um, and I saw like the war of what was happening with this these two ships clashing from the like sidelines of being like person I care about very deeply is literally getting death threats because she ships Rumidora and uh and that's not right and also like while I do prefer Wolfstar to Rumidora what is happening uh but it was it was a t- for those of you guys who were not in this in the fandom during that time uh Wolfstar shippers were passionate so there's and always like <laughs> so there's always like a top ship right like every fandom has one that has like the ship that everyone thinks is the best ship and it's all and it's so good and it has like really you know adamant fans and da 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 wolf star was that for this era of the harry potter fandom right it was wolf star it was wolf star all the time and like 
It, and Landon is absolutely right to the point that and it still is. By the yeah, way. <laughs> true. And it was to the point that like, you know, it was like Rima Dora versus Wolfstar and these two groups would send death threats to each other. Um, you know, there was like and there was like this uh, all of these like justifications. Right. So like Wolfstar um, shippers would say, like, if you ship Rima Dora, that means you're homophobic. Like, that's the only reason you could want to ship Rima Dora. And um, Rima Dora shippers would accuse like Wolf Star shippers of just being like against the canon of the books or whatever. And like it would just go back and forth like that, like insane to the point that like in the role play community, when you joined a Marauders era role play, most of them would say whether they were Wolf Star role plays or not Wolf Star role plays. Like they didn't say they were Rima Dora role plays. It will be like written in their rules or like in the character bios somehow if the role play was wolf star or not wolf star like that's how big this ship was is when you were searching for harry potter role plays um if if you had a preference then you could you could look and find it without talking to anybody you didn't have to ask the mods or anything it was just it was blatant in the advertisement of the role play yep and there was a lot of also because uh, Wolf Star was obviously a queer ship. Uh, there was a lot of like interesting weaponized like homophobia being thrown around, where mm -hmm. people would be like, "If you don't ship this, it's because you're homophobic." Yeah, uh, and it it became very toxic, and it became like as an outsider who wasn't like full in. By the way, this ship has every trope that I love, so. I don't know why I wasn't full in. I think I was not. You were just distracted by how toxic. It well, was. I think you were distracted by Dreary, and then you probably put at some point you probably put a toe in Wolfstar, and we're like, mm, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> this seems intense, and it's like you. It's like it seemed like an MLM at some point where you were like, I have to do what in order to ship this? I'm out. <laughs> that seems yeah. like a lot of requirements. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it it became it became very toxic and it tore a huge hole into the fandom. And it's why a lot of people left. Yeah. This is the point in time. And during, during this era of, of, I think probably fourth and fifth book. During uh, the long up summer. Up until, yeah. Up until Sirius is until we found out Sirius died. Like it was big. And then, and then like, so that's what it grew and then when we were introduced to the idea of Remadora and we also understood that at that point JKR wasn't as woke as she pretended to be um there was a huge amount of like oh she's only doing Remus and in Tonks in order to in order to hide the facts that they're gay and she doesn't want to write gay a gay love story and and so honestly that's homophobic and so if you're shipping them you're homophobic and 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 it it made people like yeet out of the fandom. Yeah, it really did. Cause I mean, the during the long summer, like it was all Wolf Star, right? And then yeah. Sirius dies, and then it was like that was very tragic for the Wolf Star fandom. And then all of a sudden, in you know, in the next book, when Remadora is introduced as an idea, like the Remadora fandom starts creeping up, right? And then it just became it just became insane. It just became Which, insane. And it was also interesting to watch because because while Remus and Sirius were a Fate were the favorite ship. Nymphadora Tonks, and we'll talk about her in a second, quickly became a fan favorite character. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, she quickly became one of the favorite characters. In the fifth book, we are introduced to two badass women. We're introduced to Luna Lovegood and Nymphadora Tonks, and both of them took the fandom by storm. My heart. Uh, every my heart. alternative person. Uh, saw themselves in Tonks and then also every Hufflepuff that like hadn't been seen even by Cedric Diggory found themselves in Tonks and she became she became a, like the most one of the most beloved characters of the fandom and then introduced the next book and quickly became one of the most hated characters like it was this a weird pedestal flip that I had never seen with a fictitious character before I yes. had seen it with like uh, the like the closest thing I can compare it to in my little like certain only certain corner of pop culture mind is like the flip of Taylor Swift yep. where everyone yep. loved her and then all of a sudden one thing happened and the media and everyone tore her to fucking shreds so and let's say 
exact opposite thing. So, so Landon, let's stop there because yeah. she doesn't actually come up until a little bit later in our in our list. So we gotta we're gonna That's talk about my bad. Oh no. Okay. Well, we can talk. We can talk. We can actually go straight to Nymphadora. But before we actually go to Nymphadora, let's talk about this week's sponsor. Sponsor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh no let's talk about let's talk about uh our sponsor um audible.com loving us well uh audible audible trial.com slash enter stage window audible is one of our favorite sponsors here uh because i like to read you like to read if you're listening to this because this is a series about books uh <laughs> and honestly who doesn't like their books being read to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can start a 30 day free trial at Audible uh, using the link in the chat. And this week I have a recommendation for you. And that is a book that I am currently reading right now. Uh, it's called The Girl From Everywhere by Heidi Hellig. Uh, and it is a very interesting, it's an interesting YA book. Um, basically the premise of this book is that they are time traveling pirates uh our main character nix his father is captain of a pirate ship that when they receive a hand-drawn map they can travel to that point in time in which it was created uh and so they are traveling both the world and time discovering treasure trying to make money uh and what is really happening is nix's father is searching for a map from it's called the uh it's called the 1851 honolulu map and which will bring her back, them back to the year in which Nix's father met her mother before she died in childbirth. And so there's this really interesting psychological thing under here that Nix is actively helping her father possibly rewrite her own existence. Uh, but this contrast of like fantasy and being able to time travel and everything like that, not really to do with Harry Potter, but an absolute great book uh, that I've not been able to put down since I picked up uh, and, and would highly recommend you go along with me. So that would be great for school. That is my recommendation. Hey, lady. You know what? Lady heard your Audible recommendation and she decided she needed to come hang out. So we're going to say get a little hello from lady. lady. There are tigers involved. You heard about the tigers. What? And that lady says, why. <laughs> lady says, I'm, I'm a tiger. I'm a tiger. a tiger. Okay, so. there you go, lady. All right. So um, thank you guys. Book. So go read the book. <laughs> But you know who would make a great time traveling pirate? It would be Nymphadora Tonks. Okay, so I went ahead and found the slide for her and I skipped to her because we got to talk about her next. I just can't, I, she can't be contained. The woman can't, can't be, contained. be contained. So, Thank so, you so Nymph much. yep, so Nymphadora Tonks. Um, basically, yes, she, fifth book, absolutely loved. Everyone thought she was like freaking amazing, best character ever. And then all of a sudden, Rima Dora comes out and there is this contingent of like, fuck that bitch like instant no. and like every and like the just it was interesting how the fandom completely ignored everything about a character like i had watched this happen with like characters that are obviously morally evil that are then in fandom portrayed as good kind love like just are yeah, bad like the the wubification of like characters like sephiroth and stuff like that right i've never really seen the way that a the vilification instead of the wooingfication right the vilification of a character that is all of those things and badass at the same time that is then just completely vilified and is like portrayed as a as a stupid idiotic pick me girl uh it, it, and just like a and like some just vile like theories like one of my least favorite theories uh, is that like the reason why Remus, and this is a very popular theory, this is not just a one-off. The reason why Remus fell in love with Nymphatora Tonks is because she could shapeshift into Sirius. Like that was an incredibly popular take. I didn't know which theory before. you were going to say, but you just brought back some like awful fucking <laughs> memories. And I'm yeah, like, right? yes, like, I remember I mean, this. That was a thing that was like going around Tumblr. It, like, was, it was big. That was big. Big. 
uh, and it's whack because that's like that's like one one angry shipper saying that is like one thing but if you have millions of fangirls saying that oh that's God. like a what the fuck are you talking about yes so okay so i was on the wolf star train definitely and then you know and then nymphadora tonks came out and i was definitely someone that fell in love with her okay so like i was I, at as a as a kid like as a um high school and college student right like i was so pop punk okay i was like so punk rock right i had the alternative hair i had like you know the hot topic clothes from before hot topic became a fandom placed by fandom stuff like i was in it i was going to the work tour every summer like i was all over this so when nymphadora tonks came out i was like holy fuck it's me oh my god it's me and then on top of that she is able to shape shift which i just like i've always been attracted to like a shape shifting type of power i think that's like the coolest thing and i think nymphadora tonks has is all this potential to um to be somebody that while she has like her her standard like feminine um alternative look because she can shape shift, she can be like, I don't feel like that today, right? Like, and I can do something different. And there's like so much potential there to really comment on how painful sometimes being a, a, of the female gender can be. And regardless of whether you are, are cis or not cis, um, it's, I don't think there's any cis woman that feels like sometimes like god damn sometimes i wish i wasn't you know what i mean and so like nymphadora comes in and she is all of these things and on top of that she's a fucking badass amazing wizard who can like do like all sorts of magic and fight and all of this stuff right and she's powerful and she's cool and she's fun and she's funny and she's just like she's just like so perfect and I like, I was head over heels, you know, head over heels. If it wasn't Luna that I was writing about in RPing, it was Nymphadora. Like I was all for Nymphadora. Love her. Can't get enough. No, oh, it was, she's, she was fucking badass. And like, not even, and, and then like you add in the, you were talking about like presentation of mm -hmm. gender and everything like that. And so like, also there was a healing wound there that, that like, exists still today in the fandom with Nymphadora but was certainly started to be present during that time where it was like a lot of people who were trans or non-binary or agender saw themselves in this character and could reclaim it and yes could reclaim it. and could sit there and say oh this is this is how you fit this into the world obviously Nymphadora Tonks is non-binary or like obviously or is or is multi-gendered or is like agendered and can and can change their or her appearance anytime she wants and obviously jkr wasn't writing that but there was a spot in the fandom for that and that was cool because all of a sudden you had rep like all of a sudden by the time you get to the fifth book we have rep, rep like um we have uh Repreta representation. Wow. representation you got that it. is a hard <laughs> representation available to mm -hmm, us mm -hmm. and that's and it's so, so cool. cool it's so cool <laughs> and she's and she's like and she says like oh being a metamorph magus isn't really something that you can learn you either develop that type of magic or you don't develop that type of magic and i think that really really speaks to to a experience of people's gender you know your your gender gender exists on a spectrum and it's something that you don't necessarily always get conscious decisions over so it was like really cool to see like oh there's a type of magic that can be inherent to just like sometimes it happens to you and sometimes it doesn't and um and that was just like that was like the coolest concept and my god i wish that uh, jk rowling was not you know a, a blairite annoying like conservative ish lib liberal person because it's just so obvious it's like so obvious and why isn't nymphadora like non-binary or trans or you know something outside of the typical gender binary why isn't yeah. she she should be and and it just needs space like even if jkr sat there and said no this isn't how she is uh by the time we got old enough and by the time we started ignoring jk rowling we were like fine what like fuck you <laughs> i'm gonna make i'm gonna make tonks like by the way a woman who goes by her last name that sounds androgynous like we're gonna we're gonna call her like whatever we want fuck you yeah. she i mean she admittedly hates the name nymphadora 
you know, and she she treats I mean, it as she treats it as something that's like this inconvenient legal name that she has to use sometimes, right? No so it's basically offense. a dead name for her. No offense if your name is Nymphadora, but like also hard name. I understand hard names because Landon also kind of sucks, but Nymphadora, that's a terrible name. <laughs> to go by like hi my name is nymphadora like dora is cute whatever uh but you can't like name anything like nymph is not a good imagine being a child (laughs) imagine being a child with like the shortened version of your name being nymph like yeah can you imagine how do you or first day of school like everyone goes and calls her dora but like try to be that teacher to sit there and be like what the fuck is this name nymphadora i prefer dora like you're gonna be made fun of that's a terrible name yeah tonks badass (laughs) Yeah, Tonks is a cool name. Like Tonks sounds like sounds like a girl that could kick my booty, you know. And she could. And she, she could. could in fact. Mm-hmm. She could. Um, so yeah, no, I think that is it's a really she was a great character, uh, unique in the fandom. She, I love that she was clumsy. I also love that there was there was finally some Hufflepuff representation that felt accurate. Cedric was accurate, but all the Hufflepuffs I knew were not the Cedric kind of Hufflepuffs. They were more the Tonks kind of Hufflepuffs. Yeah, the people that were like uh, so identifying as Hufflepuff in the Harry Potter fandom definitely fit more Nymphadora Tonks er- yeah. aura than uh, Cedric aura. So the same, the same way that we, the same way that like Luna Lovegood opened up an aspect of what Ravenclaw House could be like. Nymphadora Tonks did the same thing for Hufflepuff House. Yes. Uh, and it was really cool. It was like badass. Um, also, there was this young, hot, awesome soldier in this Order of the Phoenix that made it feel cool instead of like just a bunch of old people <laughs> gathering around trying to figure out how to fight a dark wizard. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say it like that, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's I mean, true. In the eyes of 15 year olds, if they're looking at 40 year olds gathered around a table, they're like, man, these people are old. <laughs> like a hundred percent. You're, you're like, you look at that. You look at all the people around your oh. parents' dinner table and you're like, nothing's getting done. If there's some cool 20 year old there though, you're like, something's getting done. True. That's like a from, a, from a kid's perspective, it's like, don't cast too hard of a spell. They might break their back, you know? <laughs> But yeah, as soon as Tonks is there, the cool factor is there. Every mm-hmm. 15 year old, I 100% am convinced that if Nymphadora Tonks wasn't there, Fred and George wouldn't fucking care. They'd be like, <laughs> we'd figure out how to fight this war on our own. But Nymphadora Tonks is in there and she's cool. So we want to join too. It like makes it legit, right? It like makes it yeah. legit. It makes but, it cool. But yeah, like I loved Tonks. I loved Tonks. I thought she was so cool. And, um, and like one of the best characters and and it's it's one thing that is remiss to me is why it took so long to have this type of character introduced because i know there's some girls at hogwarts that are like this like why why are we not are given a description about? like this of any of the characters at hogwarts because i know they existed because i know what time period that was okay i know what time period that was and there was girls at hogwarts looking like this there was what are you talking about? No woman looks like this, according to Joanne Rowling. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Anybody um, that really thinks that like Joanne Rowling is actually a feminist, like all you have to say is like, then why is Tonks the only punk rock girl in a book in that takes place in the 90s? In the 90s grunge era. Yeah. In England. In London. Where yeah, punk where punk started. Rain. Like punk she, was born there. Where are they? Sure, like, it was, she, it was she doesn't know. Years. No, she doesn't. She, she doesn't, doesn't know what girls do. She doesn't know anything about girls. <laughs> also, can I can I step on the soapbox for a second? Yes, go for it. Go. The movie did Nymphadora Tonks so dirty. I will never forgive them. There are like mm-hmm. there are like two things, three things. I will never forgive, truly forgive the movies for that. There is no excuse, no time cutting measures, no anything like that. One of them. Dumbledore shouting at Harry for putting his name in the Goblet of Fire. <laughs> the second one, uh, Voldemort's death in the end. And the third one, how fucking dirty they did Nymphadora Tonks. Mm-hmm. The actress is great and could have played Nymphadora. Fantastic. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. She's like barely there. Why bother? Why mm-hmm. bother? Yeah. <laughs> the fact 
that I couldn't, when I was looking, I ended, I know you ended up finding a different picture for her, but the fact that when I was doing the, the, uh, pictures for the slideshow and I couldn't find an official cast photo for her that wasn't shit or anything that wasn't blurry I'm like what the fuck so I had to go and take my own screenshot of this part of the movie to get a decent high quality picture because this picture exists in a lot of places but the vast majority of them are low res blurry as crap and her official cast photo I don't know like who edited that thing but it's just not cute okay it's not cute the lighting looks really really bad in it like i found high quality versions of that but they just they just looked bad you know they just looked bad oh we got a posture check okay i'll sit up straight thank you so much you saw the crazy thank you so much lunar yeah i was getting a little getting a little heated about my girl nymphadora get a little heated about my girl nymphadora but i just i just think like I think like when it comes to the movies, I feel like Nymphadora is in there for two reasons. One, because she's a fan favorite. So of course they have to include her. And there's not a lot of women in, in that are, you know, have a lot of roles in Harry Potter anyway, so they have to include her, right? But also if they cut her, then they can't do Rima Dora later, which they probably wanted to do. So of course they don't cut her character, you know, they include her, but they just don't, they don't give her anything. Like she doesn't get to do anything in the movies. Like, and I'm not just talking about the, the, the fifth uh the fifth books movie right like i'm talking about in the sixth and the seventh one too like she just doesn't oh. she doesn't get to do anything her like, entire where is she? story her entire storyline is cut from the sixth movie yeah i think the only time that we see her in the sixth movie is when she's protecting the burrow which whew, when we get to that it will that's another that's not on my list i can kind of forgive it i understand it but it is on my like why the fuck did you do that mm-hmm. uh anyway we see her at the burrow and then we don't see her get we get a throwaway line i think in the seventh movie so the first half of the seventh book and then we see her reaching out her hand for remus in the eighth movie yeah. and then see her dead like that's literally it that's all the shots you could fit gifts of all of the shots of her into one tumblr post you that's could. how small her role is in the movie and i they did her so dirty. Yeah. And I hate them so much. Yeah. I just think like, you know, someday, someday I hope for this when, um, when JKR has, uh, has passed away, you know, or shut the fuck up, um, whichever comes first, uh, that we are able to, Warner Brothers is able to take Harry Potter's IP and create like a, um, an HBO style TV show where we can really delve into it. And I would really love to see that in the hands of like somebody who understands the bits about Harry Potter that could have been much better. Cause I think there's very good bones there, but it does need a heavy edit. Um, the farther that you get along in the books to kind of fix some of the things that are really missing from the narrative where there's all set up for that there's no payoff because JKR has no driving ideology of her own except for that the status quo is good. Um, so, you know, I would love to see something like that. And in, and in my imagination, in that version of Harry Potter, uh, Nymphadora Tonks, when she comes in, like would have more of a role. Like I think they would have even given her more to do than what is in canon. Um, and just, I, you know, I have dreams. Okay. I have dreams and that would be like, so cool. Well, yeah. And, and the, I mean, I also hope they make the order bigger if they ever did that too, because I think that's the other thing too. I'm like, this is supposed to be like an A squad, A team squad thing. Yeah. But I'm like, Man, this, is, this is supposed to be like the Antifa to... super soldiers of the wizarding world. Yeah. And it, there's like five of them. <laughs> I mean, I'm they're exaggerating be... a little bit, not that much. <laughs> not that much. They're supposed to be connected people. Yeah. Uh, and, and Nymphadora is, she's incredibly talented. She's a beginning or, but she's not connected Mm -hmm. so like it would be interesting to see her do other shit and Mm -hmm. actually be connected in other ways um but yeah that's that's what i got on infidora tonks they did her so dirty and i'm so mad about it and i will forever be mad about it and um i will fight you if you say that the only reason remus and and nymphadora are together is because she can turn into Sirius. I will fight you for it. I just, I'm having flashbacks now. I'd forgotten that was, that was a thing that existed, that that was a Tumblr post that got a lot of notes. Brainwash that from your head. I, it is seared into my eyes, that post. I just can't, I can't, I, but I do remember the post you're talking about and how gajillion notes it had. And there's fan fiction about it. There's so much, and like, okay, 
don't get me wrong. It's a trope, right? I get it. It's fine. It's cool. It's a grief trope. I mean, However, like, it's cute. They probably this, did it once, but like. <laughs> for this and also the year out. And like, that's the only reason they're in a relationship. Like, guys, did you know relationship is more than just sex? Which I understand 16 year old us didn't know that. Yeah, like, no, <laughs> teenagers don't know that, Landon. Like, come on. <laughs> Jesus Christ, they're not just fucking all the time. She has to be herself at some point. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I think I like the real story is like, okay, that's probably something that like they tried once, but like, come on, if that's the reason you think they're together, like you're not paying attention and you're not giving, you're not like giving Nymphadora any agency. I don't know. If you really, really, really want Remus Lupin to be gay, that's fine. He can still be gay. You just have to accept that Nymphadora Tonks is non-binary and that his sexuality is gay and they see themselves as non-gendered and so therefore everything is still queer. I mean, it's queer no matter what because Nymphadora is queer. Right? Like it's queer no matter what because like Nymphadora is queer. She's a shapeshifter. She loves to shapeshift. Anybody that loves to shapeshift is queer. I'm making this this rule right now. It's done. (laughs) <laughs> accepted <laughs> i'm trying to th- i mean i'm trying to think of like a character that that like shape-shifting is a part of their thing that doesn't read queer to me and i really can't think of one i really can't so it's the just one, it just must the be a one thing. character that came to mind about shape-shifting oh. was the little more is his name morph from treasure island or treasure planet <gasps> yes Morph is queer. Think, okay. Oh my god. I, we're unlocking a memory. I am pretty sure at some point in a Disney RP, I or or my friend, it was very codependent. We're intertwined in the same person at that point in time. One of us did a non-binary morph. Didn't we could, do that in our in one of our Disney RPs? Because Shadow was playing um Jim. Was I? Yes. Maybe I played Morph in there. I don't remember. I don't think, I don't think it was a standard character though. I think like you played the NPC, the non-binary Morph as an NPC. I think that's what happened. I don't know. But anyway. (laughs) Speaking of Shadow, our next character is Alistair Moody. Oh my gosh. That was such a good, oh my God. Give Give yourself three points for that transition. Thank you. One, two, three. Okay. So Alistair Moody my heart, my love, one of the best characters in Harry Potter. Awesome. He's the best. He's aw- he's just great. He's great. Okay. So why do I say this? I think I have talked about this before on stream, but it's relevant to here. So we're going to tell the story again. We deep dove Mad Eye uh, last stream. That's but true. As far, but not not last stream, last book. But last that book, was yeah. as far as like who he was in the order or in the um, fourth book. Yeah. So okay. That's why we've talked about it. Okay, got it. Okay, so Alistair Moody. I love Alistair Moody. Why do I love Alistair Moody? Because when we were running our Harry Potter role play, um, we had Alistair Moody in there as a Jensen Ackles face claim. Shadow was playing him. Shadow wanted to do um, a Jensen Ackles face claim for him against a um, a, a Sam Winchester, um, Jared Padalecki face claim okay because we're problematic like that okay we like our things super (laughs) problematic if you will and so she was like the babies aren't in here lunar the babies aren't in here i'm so sorry i can refund that to you later if the babies do come in though if if, um if a lady meows again i'll hold her up okay so whenever um oh i think land is gonna go get a baby for you okay so so shadow comes to me and says karen Will you play Ludo Bagman against my Alistair Moody? There you go. There's a kitty cat. Um, for uh, and we'll do like Jensen Ackles and Jared Padalecki, and it'll be like really awesome and gay, and um, and they'll be like they'll be like gay bros. And we were like, and I was like, sweet, I love it. I'm here for it. Okay. Um, I'm I I'm just you know yes, we're gonna do the Wincess, but we're gonna make it Alistair Moody, and we're gonna make it Ludo Bagman. The reason why is because one of the very few things we learn about Alistair Moody outside of the few things that he did for the order is that he has this kind of contentious relationship with Ludo Bagman. So we wanted to explore some kind of like angsty gay romance that led to them eventually breaking up and hating each other. So from there, I just became like absolutely obsessed with this character. I think he is so cool. Um, I think he's kind of like underrepresented in the fandom in a way. 
you know, because like he's just not, you know, especially like you look at him in the movies, like he's not very pretty. Okay, he's not he's not like the Sirius or the Remus, right? Like he's completely broken from by the first war. He has a fucked up leg. He has a fucked up eye. You know, um, he has a fucked up brain. People call him mad for a reason. Okay, um, but this is one of the characters that I feel is particularly realistic. This is one of the few characters in Harry Potter that is kind of fleshed out where. I look at his passages and I'm like, I don't have a problem with this. I actually really like the way that he's fleshed out. I think he's really super cool and really realistic and really interesting. So anyway, that's my little introduction to Alistair Moody. Landon, you can talk now if you want to. I hope you enjoyed the baby you lunar. <laughs> <laughs> he's heavy. I haven't picked him up in a little while. I'm like, holy shit, you're a fat cat. Uh, <laughs> um, that was Sherlock, by the way. No, uh, Alistair Moody is you have a huge soft spot for him, which I totally understand. Uh, I He's one of the characters that I love seeing fandom renditions of him in the first war, especially Shadows, uh, of, of the way that he became who he is now because he's obviously an incredibly respected member of the ministry. Uh, but at the same time, nobody respects him at the ministry because he has gone crazy. <laughs> uh so he's, he's like tolerated he's a, right like he's tolerated because in the past he was this amazing wizard that everyone loved right yeah it's like that one person that you're like it's the, it's that one it's that like grandma with dementia that you're just like you have to love her and understand her because she was badass but also she thinks everyone is her husband 30 years ago <laughs> like, I almost think of it I almost think of it as like the white southern racist grandma like she's really yeah. sweet but she's starting to lose her mind so like the filter's just gone and sometimes she'll just say things like she'll just she'll just blurt out things and you're like grandma that is really racist you can't say that and she's just whoosh she's like I'm old and I don't care anymore you know that's yeah. how I feel like it is with Alistair so, Moody so I people like love him but it's like from a toleration perspective yeah, I can 100% see that everybody who gets recruited to the ministry, like, knows about Alistair Moody, is told to respect Alistair Moody, but then when you start working with him, everyone's like, it's fine, it's just, it's just Alistair, just take everything you say not seriously, everything he says not seriously. Just wait for him um, to stop but... talking and then you can go do your thing you need to do. <laughs> we are in a very unique situation as readers because we never see Alistair that way. Mm -mm. Uh, everything Alistair is paranoid about from book five on is true. And even then he's not over the top paranoid, mm -hmm. which was always a disconnect in my head because when we're introduced to him, we're introduced that he's an incredibly paranoid person, but, and that's how, and that's how, um, court. Oh my God. What is his name? Filch. Nope. Who are you? The person who, the person, the person who, uh, in what imperious him that took over him Barty. crouch Barty crouch thank you Barty crouch jr that's how Barty crouch jr plays him mm -hmm. and so when we see how mild manner in some ways and actually like their moody is it's a, it, it feels like a disconnect in the writing mm -hmm. um but that's my own personal like quandary with it well it's, it's kind of similar I, it's kind of similar to luna lovegood right so yeah Everyone thinks that she's crazy and like and conspiracy theory and all of this stuff. But the truth is almost everything that comes out of her mouth turns out to be true. And Alistair is the same way. Like people think he's crazy and paranoid and whatever, but most of the things that he's worried about turn out to be true. But I also feel like Luna Lovegood is because not everything Luna says is true. She still says crazy shit. But most of it's true. <laughs> most of it's true. Most okay. Of it is true. I don't think there is a time when we see Alistair say crazy shit right because the only time that we really see him overly paranoid mm. is in the seventh book retrieving harry and he turns out to be right yeah he has every right to be paranoid he has every right to be paranoid in that situation he has every right to be paranoid the younger people are not taking him as seriously but as readers like we understand what's going on and he is right there is never a point in time where where he is wrong or he mm -hmm. says something that's like way too wild yeah like he is perfectly sane yeah. so it, it is it is a bit of a disconnect that i see but i appreciate the role that he plays as far as he is the only character that is a mentor to harry without being a father figure to him yep 
Yep. So he gets uh, to actually have like a for real, I guess you could say like for real teacher, you know, that doesn't yeah. kind of like think of Harry as a, as a, as a surrogate child or things like that, you know, or doesn't or have like a, a weird soldier. connection to James. Yeah. Or a child soldier. Yeah. No weird connection to James. You know, Alistair just straight up is like, you need help kid. Come here. I'll help you. Yeah. Alistair shows him the photo of the original, of the original bad of the original order of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. He like kind of gives him information uh, he's the one that like can see the Bogart in uh, the in the drawing room in Grimald Place at the beginning of the fifth book, mm -hmm. like and and kind of talks Harry through it. He is very human and very much treats Harry with the level of respect an older person would would treat someone who is soon coming of age, and it's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's the only time we ever see clarity with that. And because we have that clarity as a reader and we don't have anything obscuring or anything heavy in the relationship, it makes it feel sane. Yeah. Uh, and, and this man is supposed to be crazy. So it, there was always never a real connection to Elastor Moody for me. I've always liked who he was in theory, but never really paid attention to who he was in the books mm. mm -hmm. because it never truly oops, connected to the theory for me. What'd you drop? my mascara oh oops. <laughs> i'm just playing with things because adhd is like all the things on my desk i play with <laughs> all right guys we need to get land in a fidget um but yeah no i totally agree in a lot of in a lot of ways you know alistair moody is definitely someone that in canon is looked down upon as this uh this character that that is more paranoid than he really is because you're right he turns out to be correct in basically everything that he's nervous about, that he's concerned about, that he acts on, he definitely does not deserve the reputation that he has. Um, and it, and I do wonder in a lot of ways why we don't really ever see any other member of the Order of the Phoenix like stand up for him and say like, you know, guys, Alistair gets a bad rap. He's not, you know, he's not what everyone thinks he is. He's not as paranoid as everybody thinks he is. Um, he's actually a, a cool dude. Um, but we do see that through the writing that he is, but nobody ever really seems to to say that or agree. You know what I mean? But also no one in the Order of the Phoenix ever treats him like they do in the in the world true right? no one ever questions moody's paranoia which mm -hmm. again makes then feel affirming in the writing and so it just is it's it's an interesting disconnect um i the character is cool concept mm -hmm. like there is this man who has been who has lost limb and eyes and parts of himself hunting dark wizards and refuses refuses to retire yeah um, yeah and, and continues to be continues to be this hero without really being a hero for it until he's dead yeah tragic and then and then his eye gets used for things beyond what he would approve of yeah <laughs> that's, like a, that's a cool little thing there too that i think um i think we don't really see harry connect with moody except except for like a little bit and that's why the eye feels genuine when they're like we're gonna fucking steal this back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fuck this <laughs> yes no i i agree i think i mean alistair is just one of those characters that i i think is uh is actually very well written which i think we've talked about this many times so you guys know at this point like the characters themselves are not what make us love harry potter or loved harry potter when we were you know in the middle of it right it was more about like the locations and you know the feeling of like i want to go to there when you read harry potter you feel like oh my gosh i want to go to there um there were some, there were some tropes and some characters that yeah. like that connected me, but for yeah. the most part. Yeah. But Al Alistair Moody is one of the characters that, that I connected with. You're seeing a trend here, right? You guys are seeing a trend with the Order of the Phoenix characters. I'm actually talking about how I connected with them in ways that I don't talk about with most of the other characters in Harry Potter. Interesting hey. that, right? Interesting that. <laughs> it's almost like us not being force-fed characters that feel ingenuine yeah. uh, make us love them more. Yeah, and I just, and, it, and it's why I was so drawn to Marauder's Era. Um, I think, I think Lady wants back in. I think I heard her, but we need to first find, let's go to the next character we want to talk about. Okay, He's here we hot. go. All I right, get us started on, he is hot. <laughs> get us started on Kingsley while I go grab Lady. I think she's right outside the door again. Okay. 
So here's the thing about Kingsley Shacklebolt that I love. He is the only person in the ministry or in the Order of the Phoenix that feels genuinely like a part of wanting to be in the Order of the Phoenix and also understanding why he's turning against the ministry. And it is not necessarily because we know anything about him. (laughs) Oh, it's a kitty. I Um, hope you like this lunar Lady doesn't Lunar like it, but baby. it's okay. She tolerating it for the cuteness. You're so cute, baby. You're so cute. Um, but just man, okay. So in this again, there's a lot of things in here that JKR didn't intend intend, and I know it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it in here anyway. Um Kingsley is black, canonically, and in the movies. Uh he is black, and he is a wizard cop. <laughs> who is actively being oppressed by the system that is becoming more corrupt. Uh, And then he's like, you know what? I want to change the system. I'm going to join, I'm going to join the upstart, uh, the upstart group of ragtag volunteers who are going to overthrow the system that I dislike and find is corrupted. And then I am going to eventually end up in charge of the new system. Yeah. You know, what's really funny that's also, such a cool story. <laughs> you know, what's really funny also, cause I think Kingsley exemplifies this, but this is actually true of um, Moody and Remadora or sorry, Moody and Nymphadora too. Um, there's all these like cops that joined the, the uh, Antifa organization, man, that's, that's like would never happen in real life, but like, wow, there that's would interesting. Be- there would be one or two and they would be the bad at they would be the kingsley shacklebolts of the world i think that they would much more be the kingsley shacklebolts and the nymphadora tops true yes okay the ones that are actively hindered by the oppression of the system or whatever yeah lady's tail keeps hitting the microphone so i'm sorry if y'all are getting like weird noises it's her tail it's her tail hitting the microphone I'm not hearing it, so you're good. Okay. Okay. So we also have to talk about with Kingsley Shacklebolt that isn't it interesting that he is one of the few explicitly POC characters, he's the black character, named Shacklebolt. Yeah, no, that's a... That's a... a... (sighs) It hurts. It hurts in the soul. It hurts in the brain. It hurts in the stomach. We didn't expect better because we just came off the hot presses of Cho Chang, but man, it hurts. It hurts. Just be Um, better. Like name him Williams or Smith. Like if you want to be stereotypical with that last name, fine. I hate it, but whatever. Do the thing. At least it wouldn't be Shacklebolt. Shacklebolt. It's Williams is better than Shacklebolt. <laughs> it's literally like, hey, um, J.K. Rowling said, hey, um, what do I know about about black people? What would what would a wizard that was like really connected to his African roots, um, and was and was black? What would his name be? Hmm. What what do I know about black people? Oh yeah, slavery and and tribalism. Slavery and tribalism. What are some words around that? Oh, shackles and kings. Okay, we're gonna name him Kingsley Shacklebolt. That's like, that's literally like the thought process. It, well, it's just like I don't even awful. Think that, that was the thought process. I think she Googled. I think she probably, whatever Googled at that point in time, la- like popular black last names, and then didn't think about the origin of where this last name came from. <laughs> Is it even a real last name? Is that like a real thing? Hang on. I yeah. have to find this out. Is Shacklebolt a real last name that humans have? I think it is a have? British, British last name. I'm Googling something, lady. I can't pet you right now. This is what she does all day while I work. I can't believe it. Yeah, so it is a British last name that uh, that existed, that's Irish and, and British. Yeah, so there's 3,000 census records available for the last name of Shacklebolt and on Ancestry.com. So yeah, you're right. It's a real last name. Um, it's, uh, it, it le- I guess at least it's a real name, unlike Cho Chang's, which is a name that nobody has. Nobody um, has but uh but yeah like and, and wow it doesn't make it better but it does it does make it that it's like okay if you're if you want to do a s- stereotypical british traditional last name that sounds cool and is though like dis- and and is really tied to the people of color community fine but then think about the fucking name that you're choosing 
I mean, like, it just it's literally not like sounds it's like a different language. It's no. not like it was like in a different language and she didn't bother to translate it. Shacklebolt. <laughs> Yeah, it's in English. It's literally like, hey, guys, what do we know about black people? Oh, yeah, slavery. That's where the name probably came from. Probably, like that is I probably the or that is probably the origin of the name. I don't think she put in the thought and came and came with that. But I think that that is the origin of the name. And then she didn't bother to think beyond looking for a last name. Yeah, she's just it's just so like lack of thought in the names and people like it's like the <laughs> It's like all the things that you shouldn't do when you're naming your characters and Kingsley and there's so many examples of this in Harry Potter but Kingsley Shacklebolt like really really exemplifies like all the things to not do when you're naming your character and like the yeah. movies take this to the next level right so the movies take this ne to the next level with the costuming for this character where they make it like so African inspired which like would be super cool if his name wasn't fucking Kingsley Shacklebolt. If his you know? name wasn't fucking Kingsley Shacklebolt. And also, they don't need to because his canonically, like, because Shacklebolt is a wizarding name. Yeah. So canonically is from Britain. So he wouldn't be, like, it's not like he grew up in a country in Africa and immigrated to Britain and has kept his, like the traditional clothing of his people because he likes that and that is what customary for like you know for wearing to work or robes in that area he's he's british <laughs> so like he would adhere to british fashion and and even if he grew up like his parents were immigrants or something like that even then like like it just is it's shocking to me mm -hmm. And sure, if you wanted to play with that, but there was no reason to. It just was a racist choice. Yeah, it just so makes me, it. It just makes it smell racist. It just makes it smell smell racist because, like, okay, here's here's how you change this or fix this if you really wanted to have, you know, um, like wizarding robes from Africa or from a country in Africa, and you wanted that to be the choice then you change the character to be native from there. Yeah. Like instead of instead of just being like, oh, he's black, so he must be from there. Uh, you give him like have the actor use an accent. Have have hire an actor that is native to uh, some sort of uh, some like make him Africa. explicitly like, African as opposed to a, a black African. person living in the UK. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's, uh, to me, it's the same thing as if they dressed Dean Thomas in in robes of like if they if dean was like oh instead of hogwarts robes i'm going to dress in in african and robes from african descent like like it's that level of it's the same fucking thing it's just thoughtless right because i think all of these elements all of these elements you could have any single one of these except for the name like shacklebolt's just too far you can't have that um, yeah. All of these elements you could have, but because there's no nuance applied to them all together, they just seem like a walking stereotype instead of, you know, anything that's like actually saying something interesting or doing something interesting. And the costuming is movie specific. He is not in, he is in wizarding robes uh, and is very clearly British in the books. Yeah. Um, when we see him and meet him, he's wearing regular robe or he's wearing British robes. He's wearing, he is of that fashion. He's actually wearing aura robes. So like they, there is a uniform attached to it. Um, which, which isn't a thing in the movies. Sense in the movies, but they decided not to. Um, well, cause then it would have been like, so obvious that aurors are cops and it would have felt really weird. I think visually they couldn't have done that the way it's said in the books. I know. But you know, ors are wizard cops. They are, uh, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> so I think that that like really um, puts it all in there, and it's just is just interesting. Yeah. I am sorry, I insulted ors. They're wizard detectives, which are fancy wizard cops. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! All right, I uh, hope you guys are really loving. Like, Lady just won't stop crawling all over me. I hope you guys are loving it. Very this. cute. I'm loving it. <laughs> um, no, and I think, but I think that that's the thing that makes Shacklebolt unique or Kingsley unique is that he he he, he matters, yeah. right? He matters in the ministry. Arthur Weasley doesn't fucking matter. Uh, Mad Eye Moody doesn't matter. Also, he's not new to us. Remus, Sirius, they don't matter. Nymphadora Tonks is a newbie first year or she doesn't matter. Nobody matters. Mm -hmm. 
Except for Kingsley. Yep. He's got them connections. Which is cool. And it does feel real. And it does. He is one. He is the only character that feels like they're actually infiltrating and getting information. Everybody else can't, can't get information to for shit. But Kingsley Shacklebolt can. Mm-hmm. And Kingsley can also then derail like the hunt for Sirius Black. Yep. And it's it's really cool. It's cute. I it's it's I like that. It it feels real. Yeah, I agree. I like Kingsley. I think he doesn't get enough love in the fandom. Um, I think he doesn't get enough love in canon because he's actually like a really important character, and without him, a lot of things would not make any sense. Um, but uh, but you know, we we get what we get, and he's his name is Shacklebolt, and that's the only thing in the fandom anyone ever talks about is how stupid his name is, which is true. It is stupid. Um, but he's stupid. a cool guy. He is. There's like cat hair know. like all in the air now, you guys. Like, I, you can't like, see it. You can't see it, but it's I can see it. <laughs> there's, there's cat hair all over my shirt. Uh, Sherlock is a black cat, but now there's black hair, hat, hair ugh, black cat hair everywhere, and I'm just like, don't sneeze. And also, I'm covered in hair. <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's that about kingsley that's that about kingsley i i wish there was i wish there was more i wish there was more to him um than just talking about his name as far as the fandom goes but there's not really um you know and there's a reason for that and it's because of of how he's kind of downplayed in canon and and he shouldn't be just kingsley deserves more love so yeah okay now we are okay so next mundungus fletcher mundungus fletcher okay who's mundungus fletcher we don't see him in the fifth book. No. But we do see him in the sixth and seventh book. And he is an incredibly important part of the Order of the Phoenix that we decided we needed to talk about him. Yes. So Mundungus Fletcher is is the opposite of uh, Kingsley, which also makes him feel interesting because he is a low-level criminal. Um, I'm like, this is, again, just you're seeing how widespread this network is this feels widespread that you have some criminals in there you have some you have some ministry i wish that they had other accesses and places but they didn't Mm -hmm. um so but you have a low level snitch for lack of a better word who's who is basically being paid to be a part of the order of the phoenix he's not even I don't think he even really supports the. There's no proof in canon that he actually supports the cause. In my heart, he uh, does. In my heart, he does. But you're right. In canon, we have no proof of that. I just want canon, him to because ideologically, it makes sense. I think ideologically, it makes sense, and he should. Uh, but I also think that he is. Uh, he lives in the society where money matters more than anything else, and yeah. safety and comfort matter, and that he is going to like most people side with the person who is going to be able to provide that for him the most yeah and in this case it is the order of the phoenix so he chose to go with the order of the phoenix rather than voldemort and that makes him smarter than i think a lot of the underground criminals in the universe like in this harry potter universe because he sees what happens if he did choose voldemort Mm -hmm. and ultimately he he read the writing on the wall and chose the other side it doesn't mean that he's thankful or grateful to be there (laughs) yes no i totally agree and i think and i think in in reality there would have been a lot more mundungus fletchers in you know because yes. i think like you've got you've 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 got two situ you've got a two situations right because this is supposed to be like a fascist allegory and when you have in real life when you have this sort of thing where you start to have like um fascists and um you know, socialists or communists on the other side, kind of like branching out from liberalism. It comes from a place of like, there's a lot of inequality in the world. And so you've got these people that are on the lower rungs that tend to be drawn towards like one side or the other. But the way that it is in the Harry Potter world, because in the Harry Potter world, um, liberalism is the is the prevailing ideology that is quote unquote correct. Um, you know, we have to keep the status quo. And so what ends up happening is we have one example of like a lower class person going towards or- the order of the Phoenix. And like everyone else goes, this love the lower classes goes towards Voldemort, which is not how it happens in real life. It's a, more of a split in real life when these sorts of things happen. But JKR doesn't actually understand politics or the movements of, you know, large groups of people in a society. She doesn't. So she doesn't write it like that. So Mundungus Flesher, I feel like, is this embodiment of this character that there should, in reality, be multiple of, of people that are like, you know, the world is not fair. Um, Voldemort coming back just means that things are going to get worse again. Um, This is awful. 
and uh, and we should actually try to fix things, you know, and, and make things better for everybody. And I, I think he's, you know, he's a fantastic example of that type of person. But I just, when it comes to Mundungus Fletcher, my thought is constantly like, there would be more of him. There would be more of him in reality. And I think that there probably, if if this was a book about the Order of the Phoenix, there would have been. Yes. Uh, although I think canonically there doesn't need to be because there's so little time spent there. Yeah. Um, what I wish there were less of is ors, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that, uh, that like, yeah. And I think that also his relationship with the Order of the Phoenix is interesting too, because um he's he's managed he's not a part of the group he's managed by him yeah uh and that's an interesting take and concept um and I really like it and he at the end of the day he is looking out for himself as most people would be during a time of war he's looking out not necessarily what is going to put the most money in his pockets but going to make him the most secure Mm -hmm. uh there's an interest it's very interesting that mundungus fletcher and slughorn are introduced in the same book um because they're they're set up to be the same character however they're very different Mm -hmm. slughorn is a very selfish person for uh his own gain of title status material wealth all of those kinds of things he is selfish in that way mundungus is selfish for survival uh while while slughorn is doing all of this selfish things for more and being the kingmaker in that sense mundungus is just living in the hard world um but they're often put in the same box i feel in yeah. fandom well, uh, which is just the very brave use of understanding both characters. Yeah, and because and I think the tone in which both of them are written is very similar. Like they're both written in a very similar tone, um, and yeah. I think that we get the impression that Harry regards them similarly. But their their yes. motivations are very different. I think you're absolutely because... right. I think Mundungus Fletcher is somebody that is just is more worried about like, do I have enough to make rent this month? You know? Yeah. And I think that that makes them incredibly different than than uh, Slughorn even though I don't think Harry sees them differently and to an extent I don't think J.K. Rowling sees them differently that's the thing right that's the um and and god Slughorn is one of my favorite characters we'll get to him I'm we'll get to him in the next we'll talk about him we'll talk about him in the next book I'm sure but Landon loves kingmakers (laughs) oh favorite trope um but I think that there is a very interesting just like thematically and maybe we'll talk about this in the next deep dive too why these two characters were introduced at the same time and what jkr is trying to say by that mm-hmm. um but no i think i'm mundungus fletcher is low-key criminal tr- doesn't isn't built the world isn't built for him yeah. in a way that it isn't built for a lot of people in our society it's built for a certain kind of person and unless you play the game of that of the rules of the world you're not going to succeed and if you do play the rules of the game you might not succeed anyway yeah. uh and that's kind of what mundungus has has figured out yeah and so he's yep. he's operating through the world doing the best he can and what's great about him is that he's not um he's not you know his disadvantage is not magical in nature you know he doesn't have a werewolf curse he doesn't have, you know, this um, this going on about whether he's pure blood enough, you know, or half blood or whatever. Like no one seems to care about his blood status. You know, he's not he he he's he's a, a guy, so he doesn't have a marginalized gender. You know, like it's literally just it's literally just socioeconomic for him. Well, he is white, yeah, but it's literally just Look socioeconomic same. for him. So yeah. it's really interesting. It's really interesting to see that because I think, and I do think that this probably came partly from the fact that J.K. Rowling did have a portion of her life where she was very, very poor. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's probably why Mundungus Fletcher hits as good as he hits because it is a very like you know low level criminal, poor person just trying to survive type of experience that's portrayed through Mundungus Fletcher. Yeah, we're supposed to see him as a slum person. We're supposed to see him as a person that were a ratty rat person. Again, I mean, there's a very similar personality and type to Peter Pettigrew. Like there's a natural comparison of the the sort of like, uh, my loyalty is to the highest bidder. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and that it just happens to be that they chose different sides. Um, but yeah, I think that that he's he's one of those fascinating skeletons of a character that we we get in the Order of the Phoenix. Yeah, and again makes it feel genuine to an extent. Like this, if there hadn't been a Mandungus Fletcher, this this wouldn't have worked at all. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Because it's like, well, how the fuck are you? Get- I mean, yeah, you have you have a werewolf getting inside information on the werewolves, but how the fuck are you getting other information other than Severus Snape? Like, yeah. what is happening? <laughs> yep. So Mundungus Fletcher, he's awesome. Um, love him. Uh, the my only, as I, I just want more. I just want more. You know, that's it. All right. Last character that we want to talk about is Arabella Fig. So Arabella Fig is one of the uh, premier examples that we get in the Harry Potter universe of a squib. So those are characters that are considered part of the wizarding world. They have a wizard lineage, but they do not actually have the ability to do any magic. So it's kind of like the opposite of a muggle-born wizard. It's somebody that's born from wizards but does not have magic they uh, they effectively like i guess on a genetic level you could say are muggles but because they were born into the wizarding world they know everything about it and so they 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 can't be like muggles in the sense of not knowing that the wizarding world exists it's impossible for them which is a fascinating idea because like we don't get much information on what makes a person magical Mm -hmm. but because squibs exist we get a sense that it is a genetic, like it's a genetic component. And that that some people are just not born with the gene, even if they have two parents that are carriers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then that then goes back into like blood and genes and and eugenics to an extent and sitting there and being like, okay, how does that, how does that work? Uh, Because it's also not supposed to be that, but it is that at the same time. Yeah, but we talked about this last last Harry Potter episode that we had, where it's like because of what Dumbledore explains about the the blood relation between Harry and Lily, and that's why he has to live with the Dursleys. Then that means that all this blood stuff it means like Voldemort has a point, (laughs) you know. And so there Um, is this kind of like blood genetic component. Or the, I don't think Voldemort has a point because Voldemort's point has never really been about blood status, right? It's just been about I'm angry at my dad, so I'm going to do anything I can to take over the world. Okay, but the ideology uh, that he that but he props the up to, ideology yeah. that the Ministry takes on, which is mm-hmm. in the seventh book, which is different from from Voldemort's ideology, uh, which more reflective of some pure blood beliefs has a point which is interesting mm-hmm. there are three different things there um and it's like okay that yeah maybe there is this idea of theft of magic because no one actually understands how magic works but how do squibs get born what does that look like what happens with that is it a genetic component in order to be a muggle born do you have to have wizarding ancestry somewhere or is it just fucking random mm-hmm. uh it it and we never get answers for this because yeah, that's the yeah. thing that there are no answers because she didn't realize she was raising more questions with <laughs> this concept. And it's unfortunate that, that the conclusion I draw is the same in the sense of like, there's no answers because she didn't realize she was raising these questions and not just because there's purposefully no answers. Cause I think there really shouldn't be answers to this. Cause even if she realized what questions she's raising, oh, there yeah, shouldn't this- be answers to this in the same, in the same way. Cause if you're going to have like, you know, a racism, fascism allegory, then there shouldn't be answers because in real life, these sorts of things, like they're, they're all, they're all, they're made up, right? There's no answers to them. Why people believe these things because, you know, races are, are a social construct not a genetic one not really right and and it should be the same way but that's not true the reason why there's no answers is because jk rowling didn't realize it and didn't doesn't have answers it's not because it's not because she purposefully didn't put answers in unfortunately but i think that it is what would have been better in my opinion is that there had been a fake answer like that that wasn't the real answer but that is the answer that the like and I I guess we kind of get this in the seventh book but that is what the propaganda is pushing because on the people who are on the spectrum of like being fascists there are answers for things that are being pushed even if those answers aren't true or accurate at all 
Yeah, I guess yeah. the seventh book goes into it like a tiny bit. A and tiny I, bit, and I but wish not really. it had been, a, I wish those answers had been a little bit more developed and didn't leave us guessing so that we understood what it was that they were fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, but this has nothing to do with Arabella. <laughs> but but Arabella Fig is in this interesting spot, right? So she's this yeah. squib and she's kind of placed there by Dumbledore um, to watch over Harry and make sure that the Dursleys abuse him just the right amount, right? And mm-hmm. why I say that and why I say that is because she's she's the one that like babysits Harry whenever the Dursleys need a babysitter and she never does anything about the abuse that he's facing. Not that I expect when a kid's being abused that some other adult like can do something. Like I don't believe that, but she doesn't even show any interest in doing anything. She doesn't even seem to show interest in acknowledging that Harry was being abused. And she, she literally just follows Dumbledore's orders to the point that whenever she's called on by Dumbledore to lie in court, she does that too. She does that too. Yes, she does. She says that yes, yeah, I can see I can see dementors. She can't see no dementors. She can't see dementors because she tries to describe them and she can't do it. She's like following a script that Dumbledore gave her in describing the dementors. She's never I, seen one. I'm not sure I have the same take as that. I don't think she can see them. I know I don't I, think she can see them. I don't think she says that she can. She Sorry? Says she, she doesn't say she can. She says she can't. Yeah, she Does says she, she can. And she that. says, yeah, she says she can. And she describes she them. She feel she describes the feeling. Okay, now I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. yeah sorry, I'm remembering. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're clo- cloaked and hooded. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I was, about, I was but, like googling it. I'm like, I know, I know that this is what happens. Yeah, she she cannot see Dementors, but she her in her testimony she says that she could see it, and knew what was happening, and testifies that Dementors were there, even though she couldn't really know that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I think, but she does. She does say how they feel, and mm-hmm. that does convince them that they knew that there was Dementors there. Yeah. Even though, like, she really didn't experience that. She was just saying that based on what I think. Anyway, we don't get proof of this, but I think Dumbledore gave her a script and told her to say these things. I and and I and I'm not sure I believe that, but for whatever, I think that she. I think she just wasn't a charismatic person and just was truly un, unbelievable um but no, yeah i just I mean, think she was lying i think she was lying for dumbledore i don't know um but i think that either way she is told to watch over harry but make sure that he's being abused the, the right amount um and again i think that this is just kind of lazy it's it's not lazy writing I understand wanting to connect a character that you had. It's like connecting an NPC into a story that they weren't a part of originally, but then Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, this would make sense in a good callback. Um, And it doesn't, but it doesn't fit for this. Um, Because I don't think she ever was supposed to be a squib or on Dumbledore's side or any of these things. It was just one of those things where it was like, how am I going to get Harry out of this mess? We only know one person in that area other than the other than the Dursleys. Mm-hmm. So let's do a callback. And yep. and it and it's fine, but it just yeah. It's um, not just it's not connected though. It's just more proof that these things were not planned the way JK Rowling says they were. Yes. And I also want to say this. I am glad that the that the uh that the movie and the director and the casting and the casting person chose a person of color to play this character because a harry potter's incredibly white and we need mm-hmm. more people of color however i don't believe petunia and vernon dursley would allow a person of color to watch anyone <laughs> it does seem off right it does seem off I but we, like, we also we we also learned that like you know petunia like knows what's going on in regards to magic and has of course because her connection to lily so like the only the only way the way that it could still kind of work is like you know oh well they knew she was a squib and and it was like all set up and they they knew and you could make it work that way but there's no evidence of that either no i and i don't think that i think that would even make it even worse they would like move right away if they knew that 
<laughs> maybe i mean who do, who knows who knows it's who all knows? very but disconnected it's just one of those things where i was like okay yeah i mean i like this actress this is awesome yeah. this actually makes it look like they are in london and not just like you know in a period piece but <laughs> Ver- vernon would have hated this person <laughs> <laughs> i think that is true Very much. <laughs> i think that is true and it's and it's it i do think that it was a case of like oh there's this crazy cat lady that um that watched Harry as a kid and let's and let's bring her back now and say she was a squib. Yeah, I do think that's was, exactly what happened. Is, and that is yeah, that is, that is what happened. And I think um because I also think that they probably disliked the idea of someone under the invisibility cloak watching him. Yeah. Right? Like cuz we we have a hint of that that there is someone on patrol watching him. Um because there's like the car that backfires and someone mm-hmm. disapparated during that time. But like it's like okay um what the heck <laughs> we can only have so much of that we can only have so much of that so, so yeah um she's we don't really know much about her the fandom doesn't really care about her it's just an interesting concept of uh, another way that i feel the books tell and don't show the amount of power the order of the phoenix is supposed to have yeah it seems very hollow like that the squid is has uprooted her life, moved away from family, is living in this house for 11 years on the word of a man who says that she should do this because she's been exiled from the magic community given the fact that she's a squib. Mm -hmm. Watching a boy be actively abused, in some areas taking part of that abuse because she's not speaking up, uh, gives him a respite in a safe place every once in a while Mm -hmm. uh and then possibly lies to people on Dumbledore's behalf that's a lot especially because we never see anything from that and we never like there's no indication that the order is that powerful and there's no follow-through on (laughs) understanding why Dumbledore and Arabella have this connection yeah no not really um there really isn't so she's just kind of this extra character that's in the order of the phoenix that kind of does like this one thing and then uh and then we kind of forget about her and it, it's unfortunate it's unfortunate because um she she's kind of something that's put in there that's like oh well this makes it all make sense and fit together but it kind of just raises more questions instead of actually making it fit and make sense yep all right so i think at this point we are towards the end of our show we are okay so I have a good news article yeah okay so as we like to do with um some of our episodes we like to end a lot of our episodes with some good news so here we go here's our good news for this particular week road in london closes for nearly a month to protect migrating toads as they hop to the other side so landon why did you choose this article and if you could tell us a little bit about it First of all, it's in London. Second of all, it just brought me joy. <laughs> I just love the idea that this small little community in Ham, which is uh, in, in England, Northern England, or Northern London, uh, decided to just close a road <laughs> because there are toads that need to hop to the other side of the road to get to the pond in order to breed. Uh, and they kept it closed for like a month. And it, it was a charity that originally did it, um, but it was volunteer. They got city approval. The city was very much here for it. Uh, and it was just like this little little intersection area that they closed one side of the road. They were like, hey, migrating fr- toads, migrating frogs are crossing the road. We don't want you running over them. We're taking care of this to find another way to get there. This is so cute. The little signs are so cute. Road closed for migrating toads. Toad patrol volunteers on the road. This is so adorable. This is so adorable. And I think it just is like, it's a reminder that we have built this world that was already operating prior to us being here. Mm -hmm. So that there are toads that need to get to the other side of roads that we built in order to continue to exist and that we need to make accommodations for those things Mm -hmm. uh in some aspects we have and and like this is a small one and 
we'll never actually be able to accommodate everything that we should because we're constantly intercepting everything that should be happening. But this is a small way that we can sit there and be like, hey, these toads matter to our town. (laughs) So we're going to take care of these toads. It's very cute. It's very cute. And I love this for the toads. And I just think like, I just think the more that we can do stuff like this, the better, right? Like the more that we can do like, um, you know, land bridges for animals where we've built, we've built too much city or too many roads for them to get across. Um, There's other, there's some areas like that where they have like land bridges over it so that animals can cross. I think the more that we can do like this, you know, the better. And, And I know, and I know that it's not much and it doesn't undo a lot of the damage that we did to our planet but at least it's something so um so good on these uh good on these londoners in ham uh closing their road for the toads it's so nice it just brought a smile to my face on this saturday afternoon that's right all right okay so that is the end of our show you guys so um at this point we're going to start to close out so i'm going to look for someone to rate into and while i do that landon tell everybody where they can find you you can find me on Instagram at Land in Maine. Uh, sometimes I post funny things. You can post me. You can find me on Twitter at Land in Maine. Right now, uh, I've been want, been binge watched all of season two of Hamilton. Hamilton Bridgerton sounds very similar. Uh, <laughs> and I hate Edwina Sharman. And I'm about to go on a Twitter rampage about it. So oh my gosh! You can come follow as I as I disturb one other fandom in my life um yeah those are the places you can follow me oh my gosh well landon speaking of things to watch have you watched turning red i need to we started we started it in my class yeah (laughs) i was watching them be obsessed with the 13 year old boys in it uh and i was just like wow i've seen all of the children do this exact all the girls in this room do the exact same thing over some boys and also I did that when I was 13. Oh my god, <laughs> so it is everything. It that movie is everything. Cool. It's so I good. It okay, like for real, you guys, on that movie, if y'all watched it and you didn't like it, like and we're friends, I really question like why you like me. Like that movie hit my heart in like that hard that I'm really like if we're friends and you didn't like that movie like why are we friends I'm really confused I have a feeling it's gonna be just a cringy a cringy mess and I might dislike it for that but I'll probably also love it for the fact that it's accurate it's good cringe okay it's good cringe I promise you I promise you it's good cringe okay I will (laughs) trust you (laughs) it's good it's good like it really like um you this this friend group in the movie like you had this this friend group like you did there's no way you didn't we are this friend group (laughs) yeah we are this friend group as adults for real (laughs) all right you guys um so where can you find me you can find me of course right here on twitch on uh on saturdays we do our stream that has like some of my friends with it we do community days we do podcasts like this and then on thursdays that's my solo stream right now most of what we're doing is a pokemon leaf green nuzlocke and sabrina can go die in a fire she killed a bunch of my pokemon and uh, but we're you know we're recovering we're gonna come back from it it's gonna be cool it's gonna be fine um you know we uh we 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 say goodbye to our fallen soldiers and we move forward so so that's my content i love that (laughs) that's amazing it was it was Um, awful it was awful and you can find me on twitter that's my main social media we also have a discord server the discord server is um because we're we're all role players text-based role players so you can get role play help there i also um it also has my content landon's content and then our friend kendra also who is in this small group her content as well um so if you're interested in keeping up with what we are doing that is the best way um because it is you know we can control the notifications in discord in ways that we can't on other platforms that's always the best way for the three of us to find our content all right we're gonna raid into ingsy because for whatever reason like no one's live right now it's like literally just ingsy i'm like where are all my friends i don't know i don't know know where my friends are also uh wish me luck i have to read two books this weekend so oh my gosh uh, you with me (laughs) good luck two books in one weekend i don't know how you're gonna do it but i know if anyone can read that fast and actually understand what they're reading, it is Landon. So good luck. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right, you guys, the raid is ready. We're going to raid into Ring Ingzi. He is playing Raft right now. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. All right, bye, guys. See you later. Bye.